Hello and welcome to today's presentation on a post-factor world. I am Adam Butler, the Chief Investment Officer of Resolve Asset Management. Please take a moment to look at our disclaimer that discloses important information about some of the data and analysis used in this presentation. I would also highlight that Resolve publishes a wide variety of content, including uh, blog articles, white papers, as well as uh, quite a bit of podcast content, including Gasalt University, which uh, is a fairly technical deep dive into some um, timely investment topics with leading experts, as well as Resolve's Riffs, which is brought to you live every Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern Time with a variety of uh, popular and timely guests. All right, let's talk about a post-factor world. Well, look, over the last few years, investors have been clamoring for so-called factor or smart beta strategies. These strategies emerged from academia, predicated on the work of Trainer, Sharp, Hulgin, Fama French, and others in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Many early hedge funds earned extraordinary profits from these strategies in the 70s, 80s, and 90s by allocating to stocks with, say, strong momentum or deep value characteristics or futures markets with strong trends. In some ways, new investment concepts are like any new technology. The progenitors of any early technology typically earn extraordinary profits until competition heats up. Eventually, competition drives down profit margins and the technology becomes commoditized. But investment technology has a special quality that arises from the adaptive or reflexive nature of markets. This property means that the profitability of investment concepts conforms to a unique trajectory which most investors haven't accounted for. Look, factor investing is predicated on the idea that an investment opportunity exists because securities with certain characteristics are systematically avoided or mispriced by a cohort of investors. This may be because these investors are influenced by unique preferences or perceptions of risk or for a variety of other reasons. In any case, smart beta or factor strategies typically derive their credibility and persuasiveness from academic credentials and peer-reviewed journals. A paper is published which describes an investment strategy with an intuitive origin story. A back test and a comprehensive analysis is presented with strong economic and statistical significance. Word spreads about the new investment concept. A few big in institutions jump on board. Innovative managers launch funds which do well for a few years and catch the eye of more adventurous investors and advisors. A few more years pass. Now most institutions are running the strategy internally. Index providers have launched a mosaic of takes on the concept, many of which go on to inform new index ETFs. Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, there comes a point when the arbitrage dollars from all of these uh, factor strategies start to crowd out the mispricings of the investors who were creating the opportunity in the first place. So that securities that were underpriced now become overpriced and the sign of the edge inverts. So it's now a money losing investment. Okay, what do you think happens next? Well, look, obviously investors eventually cry uncle and abandon the strategy in droves. At some point, the market finds a new equilibrium premium that's just large enough to keep the most disciplined investors engaged, but much smaller still than the original pre-publication premium that everybody got excited about in the first place. Let's walk through a concrete example to help crystallize the concept. Many of you will probably recall that a few of the most sophisticated institutions and hedge funds started running systematic alternative strategies in the mid-2000s to harvest the size, value, low volatility, trend, momentum, carry, and other so-called factor strategies. These innovators and early adopters harvested rich premia for a few years before the ideas went mainstream. By 2011 or 2012, the investment banks had launched all premium indices and major investment managers had launched funds, attracting tens of billions of arbitrage capital from the early majority investors. These billions were typically levered up five to 10 times in order to hit the required returns of these early investors. Well, by 2015, most major institutions had built or were building internal desks to harvest these premia and eliminate the fund fees from external managers and meanwhile, retail investors were getting in on the act with an array of index funds. 
Fast forward to 2016, 2017, alt premium strategies are now broadly adopted and many of the largest style premium funds have actually been closed to new investors. The late majority was all in peak alt premium. So what happened after 2017, do you think? <laughs> Inversion. This chart plots the cumulative alpha from a benchmark combination of leading alternative premia and systematic multi-strategy funds from January 2018 through July 2020. We scaled the funds to express equal risk in the portfolio and called it the alt premia benchmark. We also overlaid a cone that charts the trajectory of a random walk with zero return and the same volatility as the benchmark. Over the past 30 plus months, this composite representing over 15 different alternative premium sleeves has produced a return trajectory that falls well below the, th the lower threshold of the cone. We're reminded of a colorful anecdote from Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Swan, starring the characters Dr. John and Fat Tony. In the tale, a third party asks them to assume that a coin is fair, i.e. it has an equal probability of coming up heads or tails when flipped. Someone flips it 99 times and gets heads each time and then asks Dr. John and Fat Tony, what are the odds of him getting tails on the next throw? Dr. John, being dogmatic in his belief that the rules from a theoretical model of dice throwing must apply, says that the odds are not effect, affected by the previous outcomes. So the odds for the next throw must be just like for any other throw. So 50-50 heads or tails. Fat Tony says, the odds of the coin coming up heads 99 times in a row are so remote that the initial assumption that the coin is fair must be false. He figures the coin's got to be loaded. Well, look, the chart above implies that less than one chance in a thousand that the returns from our alt premium benchmark are drawn from a distribution with a positive mean. Dr. John says this is just an unfortunate coincidence. Fat Tony can't help but conclude that something fundamental has changed. So guess what? Over the last several months, our conversation with institutions and consultants makes clear that investors are heading for the exits. Pension and endowment funds are dismantling factor desks and major wirehouses have started delisting associated funds from their fund shelves. It's okay. These premia were legitimate and the market will eventually find an equilibrium that compensates arbitrage investors for taking on unwanted risk from other classes of investors. The premium will be lower, probably on par with other major premia like the equity risk premium or the duration premium, but commoditization will drive costs down commensurate with lower long-term expected performance. So what's the lesson? Well, we think investors see comfort in economic intuition, expert opinions, peer-reviewed academia, and recent performance. But sadly, these are the very qualities that destroy future returns. Alpha lives in the crevices and dark corners, lonely places where most investors just don't want to go. If asset owners and investors want to earn excess returns, then by definition, they must come to grips with the reflexive nature of markets, where a strategy offers comfort in the form of published research and peer adoption with simple mechanics, compelling backtests, and intuitive stories we should expect the market to quickly mediate this opportunity. There's no free lunch. Okay, so what does work? Well, at Resolve, we like to think of ourselves as reformed factor investors. Where factors typically have intuitive explanations rooted in economic theory, we source edges directly from the empirical data. Where factors are predicated on common relationships across all assets, we seek patterns in the data that are unique to each market. Where factor relationships are simple in structure, we seek complex relationships that are difficult to spot. Where factor strategies rely on long-term average investor behavior, we evaluate how markets respond under different conditions. And where factor strategies are evaluated on typical in-sample backtesting methods, our strategies are validated by the advanced out-of-sample and holdout methods used in machine learning and data science. Most importantly, investors must recognize that in adaptive markets, the only sustainable edge is constant innovation. That means constantly seeking information sources that explain market returns from different angles. And it involves many of the same features that market investors use, but also new sources of information sourced from, for example, the volatility surface, 
dealer gamma, dark index flows, cross-market relationships, and other alternative data sources. But new information sources alone don't produce alpha. You must have the team and infrastructure to constantly mine for and select the best new strategies, weed out antiquated edges, and pipe the constantly adapting alpha engine through to production. Thanks for listening to this presentation on a post-factor world. To get more information on how Resolve approaches this problem, we urge you to reach out to Richard Latterman at the coordinates below.